Today's programme will be slightly different. Um, we're going to be talking about um, Stuart Wilde. Uh, Stuart was a very successful uh, writer on, I suppose you could sort of loosely call New Age books, but actually the, much deeper than that, I think. Um, <clears throat> and he was a very, very big sort of player back in the sort of 1980s, I would guess, um, with uh, numerous books, um, one of them called The Trick to Money, um, and uh, Affirmations, and a number of others. And, and today I'm talking to Stuart's twin sister, Dee Dee Wilde. This series of interviews, so there's this one with Dee Dee, but I'm hoping to do some others, to um, sort of bring Stuart's uh, ideas back um, into public view because he sort of disappeared off the scene somewhat um, but yes so it, it, great chat with uh, DD as always um, and I hope you enjoy it <laughs> Today, I have Dee Dee Wilde back on again. Sorry. This is really good. So, but this is a different one, Dee Dee. Welcome. Hello. Hi, Vic. Gosh, in a mean technology, it doesn't really work. Well, uh, it, it, it does what it a does. Miracle, a miracle, a miracle. <laughs> How nice to see you in, in, you know, in person. Yes, I know, I know. Um, but we got, this is a bit of a special one, this one, because I've not done this type of interview before oh, right. okay. we're, going to, we're going to be talking about somebody else yes we're not talking about me for a change but my brother <laughs> yes exactly your brother yes. um now let's so your brother Stuart now yes. he's and of course he's not just just a brother because he's your twin brother that's or, correct yes um we were born on the 24th of September 1946 and my brother was the perfect gentleman he said after you so oh. I came up first and looked at the world, and then I said, "Okay, out you come." Okay, that's good. Yeah. So, so you, um, he was your younger brother. Yes, my <laughs> well, younger brother. Yes, I for years and years he was always shorter than me as well. All oh, right, okay. I was always up here, and Stuart was always down there. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, now a lot of people won't won't know about Stuart, but he he became. He became very well known as a writer. And yes, many he did. So what we'll do, we'll, I'm literally playing this by ear today. Yes. I have no plan how this, this will pan out. So no, it um, obviously the people who know Stuart will know, will be very interested. They probably know more about Stuart than I do. because Well, he was a bit of a dark horse. So in the latter years of his life, I never saw him. No. Once well, in a new moon, you know. Right, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that as we go. So tell me a little bit about, you know, your early earliest remem memories with Stuart. My earliest remembrance of Stuart was when we were 18 months old and we lived in um, Hamburg and my father was in the foreign office and we were just about to go back to England and this man, big fat man arrived to take all our toys away and Stuart stamped his little foot. I didn't want to know about this man taking his toys away. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. That that people say you can't remember back that far, but I remember oh, it. I remember it so clearly. Yeah. Um, so that was my first memory of Stuart of Stuart. Stuart was always um larger than life, a very, very strong character. Yes. Um, you know, I think he was obviously born to do to do big things. Yes. And also make a lot of money. Because that was that was you know his big success. He was always always making money. That was a difference between us. You know, if he had ten pounds, he'd make it into twenty pounds within five minutes. I would probably have that ten pounds, put away eight, and spend two. Yes, I've always been I've always been great with money, but not you know I've never made mounds and mounds of money like yeah. Stuart did. He had the most perfect sort of business brain yes i remember my greatest friend karen who lives in the next village 
funny enough. I mean, would you believe we were all brought up in Ghana together? Oh, God, that's amazing. Yeah, we were all brought up in Africa together. And um, she was, by the time she was 12 and I was 14, I had the flattest chest in the world and she was incredibly well endowed. And my brother sneaked up on her once when she was sunbathing and took lots of pictures and then sold them to all his friends. He sold the pictures to all his friends. Those marvelous. That was his first sort of business enterprise at the age of about 12, 30, whatever age we were, you know. So, yeah, so it was obvious that he was going to go far in the business situation. <laughs> Um, he, he went to um, the boarding school called um, St. George's College, which was about, what, half an hour away from my ballet school and was there for about seven or eight years. It was run by Josephites, Josephite monks. And, um, yeah, I suppose got a good education, like every sort of middle class man, young chap did. And um, I think he hated it there. Well, I think yeah. he did, but, I, you know, I'm only going on the comment that was yeah. made but um, yeah yeah but he was quite good at sport funny enough no, nobody really knows this but um Stuart was the school um table tennis champion he right. was he was also um trialed for young Wimbledon as a very 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 good tennis player right but unfortunately when he was 13 he got rheumatic fever oh okay and was ill for about a year right and that was terrible for him because we were living in Camberley at the time. My mother had to come back to be with us. And my brother was not allowed to get out of bed for four months. So oh he was goodness. quite ill. So that put his, that puts, you know, the Kaibon on his uh, career as maybe being a, a tennis player. I'm always interested in sort of events like that. That then when you look back, it's sort of like, well, that, that changes direction of, Oh, yes, 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 yes. I mean, whether he would have ever done that. I think I think mum and dad or dad certainly wanted him to go into the city and do things like that and go to university. And Stuart said, absolutely no way. I'm not cut out for that sort of thing. So now he, you, you, you mentioned Ghana. Ghana. Oh, yes. Going back. <clears throat> My father was in the foreign office and then he came back to England and he didn't have a job for a long time. And then he got a job. Um, in, in Africa, firstly working for the Ministry of Interior, and then in Accra in Ghana, they built this enormous um, harbour in West Africa. It was the largest harbour in West Africa, because obviously they needed one in Ghana. And because of my father's experience being commander in the Royal Navy, Daddy was the harbour master. So um, we went to live in Tema, which is where the actual harbour was. And we were there, um, Stuart and I were there from about the age of six to 17. So we grew up all our life, we grew up more or less in Africa when we were not at boarding school. Yeah, so that explains the the boarding school connection then. Yes, yes. Well, for me, it was um, just talking a little bit about me. I wanted to be a ballet dancer, so I had to be in England to go to ballet school. And of course, it was considered a good idea to have Stuart around as well. So we'd, we'd be there together because unfortunately what happened was, although my parents weren't poor, they weren't rich enough for um, to be able to um, pay for two airfares every holiday time to go out to Africa. So we only saw our parents once a year. Right. And as young children, you know, nine, eight, nine and ten, it was very, very hard. Yes. And we used to be palmed off to all different sorts of people um, for anybody who could would be charitable and please take in. My name was a leader then, a leader. Would somebody please take a, a leader in for the holidays? And if you're feeling very generous, could you please take a brother in as well? Right. And that was very hard for Stuart and I. Strangely enough, when we grew up, it didn't bother me, but my brother resented his parents so much mm. for abandoning him yeah that's what he felt that every holidays we were being abandoned i just felt there's nothing they could do about it we had to be here they had to be there so we i i just got on with it but stuart really felt indignant about the fact that um we had nowhere to go in the holidays and we had to rely on people's charity that, that's interesting because I've always been, I was always sort of in, uh, curious about Stuart's ability to sort of travel and, and, and live in a hotel. 
<laughs> if you see what I mean. Do you think yeah. that that's I mean that he felt that he wasn't didn't have a very stable home life? Yeah. Which was not my mother's fault. My mother was a typical Italian. Yeah. Mummy was Italian and my father was English and they met when my father's convoy. Daddy was commander in chief of the convoy that landed in Sicily and he met my mother there and that's how they got got to get got together. Oh. And uh, my mother used to cry all the time because all she wanted to be was be near her babies. Yeah. And um, we went to boarding school and she never saw us. Once a year she saw us. And That's that, amazing. Yes, it was very, it was very, very, it was very, very hard. But um, you know, I think sometimes as a child, I mean, that's why Stuart and I were so independent. Yes. Because the age from, from about eight or nine, we were flying across continents, hmm. um, sort of fending for ourselves. Actually, yeah. that explains so much. Yeah. Amazing. And, and um, I remember one year, the headmistress ringing, standing up, and say, you know. Please, could you ask your parents if this, if they, you know, could possibly have a leader wild in the holidays, um, and also maybe her brother Stuart? And nobody came forward. And my parents, in desperation, being thousands of miles away, put us in a boarding house in Hastings, not realizing this boarding house was for old people getting ready to sort of shuffle off this mortal coil. Why? God knows. That's they, amazing. They, they had a link, you know, and they thought it was a safe place and a good place. It was awful. It was so bad that Stuart and I, they didn't give us enough food. So we used to go down to the beach at Hastings and beg for food from people. God. We didn't have enough to eat. That was the worst. I think that was the sort of um, the Nadir, the, the lowest point of our, yes. of our lives in the holidays. Being That's in this incredible. How old were you? It was, uh, we were about 11, I suppose, yeah, oh. 10, 11. And that was very hard. That, that is, that's, that's an amazing. Yeah, I never forget that. That's why I have this incredible aversion to Hastings. <laughs> oh, the memories I have of that awful, yeah. awful, awful um, old people's home, or, or, or it, was, it seemed like an old people's home, because obviously, you know, being 11, even if somebody was 30 or 40, they were old. But all I remember was all I remember was old people sort of rattling their teacups. And right. that horrible Formica plastic um, covers on the tables and sort of like, you know, one tomato, a lettuce leaf and, and a piece of ham. Yes. But yeah. I think that in some ways, in some ways, actually, Vic, it made, you know, I talk about Stuart as us because we were twins yes it made us more determined to succeed yes and um we both succeeded in our in the our own field yes when you're so independent and you've got to rely on yourself and your own strength then you've got the schutzbar the strength to go out and, and conquer the world and do do what you want and and the determination i think yes I, 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 I totally agree with you. It's almost like, you know, how bad can get things get? And it's like, right. I can't get as bad as that. It's yeah. like, I think you probably yeah. hit the, the worst yeah. point. It, it, it was. And we, we actually, sometimes we went, hen, uh, my, hen, sorry, that's my husband. My um, father had a great friend in the, in the Navy called Jeremy Bullock. And they had a beautiful country house in Harrow in, Worc in Worcestershire in a place called Sinton Green and a lot of the holidays we used to go there and stay and that was lovely except um, that the, the couple were um, they had no children and she was a typical sort of tall thin middle class woman with with sort of attitude they were both magistrates oh <laughs> and for some reason she didn't like me so I was never allowed to do anything so, 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 you know, I, I, I was not allowed to go out. I wasn't allowed to go to cinema. I wasn't allowed to go to the farm. Stuart was a golden eyed boy. And he was allowed to do anything he wanted. And that was, that again, was living in a very beautiful house, but knowing that you're sort of the underdog wasn't much fun. But it was a beautiful place. And Christmas, Christmas was always sort of nice, except we never had Christmas with our parents ever, yeah. which was very sad. Um, and, um, yeah, it was that that again was 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 another learning curve. And I know that, that they even though they were very wealthy, they paid my parents for everything. 
that we used even down to the lavatory paper. So holidays were not something that as two children we looked forward to until we went to Ghana for our oh. summer holidays. Yay. That's, that's amazing. I, I, this, this, uh, there's so much in this. I'm just sort of like thinking, oh my God, you know, this yeah. sort of fills in the backstory. I mean, even to your to your story, you know, about when you, we, yes. you, this is not about me. This is about no, I know, but the thing is, it is really amazing because it shows the sort of that tenacity where that comes from. You know, yeah. this thing. my mother was very tenacious, very strong character. My darling father, you know, as long as he had a gin and tonic in one hand and a fag in the other, and mummy was in sort of near proximity, he was as happy as Larry. Mummy was the ambitious one. Mummy was the pusher. Mummy was the worker. And um, so I suppose that's really, because Stuart was very much more like my mum than I was. I was much more like my father. Yeah. Luckily, I did end up with a lot of personality and, you know, went on to do, to do big things. But yes, tenacity was something we both had. We both were so, so determined to do something with our lives. Mm. Mm. So what, what I'm... <sighs> What's sort of going through my mind with this is that when when people grow up, there's a tendency for there to be an illusion about how things work. Mm. You know, you're in your little zone, yeah. and you just assume oh, everything everything's fine. But with your what you're telling me, I can see that you can see how things aren't what they appear to be yeah. you know that there's a veneer of stuff and and that's the thing that always struck me about Stuart that he could see he could see beyond something mm -hmm. and underneath it and think oh that's just a load of nonsense you know this bit that's just yeah. and I can really <laughs> I can really see with your experience that you've expressed so far how that is and also the extremes of you know being in an English public school and not being, you know, during the holidays, yeah. unless you went, you know, you were on the summer holidays. Yes, yes. Summer holidays. There were two worlds. There was that, and then there was Ghana. Very different worlds, because, you know, when we were with our parents, I would say mummy and daddy were just very ordinary, lovely parents. Yeah. Um, you know, they were good to us. They weren't mean. There was always food on the table. There was always cuddles. There was always love. Yeah. Dad was a little bit more nonchalant about it all. He just went about his business. But you know, I never felt, me personally, I never felt deprived in any way. And of course, Ghana was magical, absolutely yes. magical. And for a child, uh, well, for both of us to be to be able to fly out to Africa, you know, it, it was a bonus really because instead of just being little Ingalites, as I would call us, you know, we we lived in in a tropical country and experience so much more than an ordinary child might have done just being in just being here in England. Well, that brings, and you said the word I thought was really relevant, that it was a magical place. Oh, wonderful, yeah. Because that's the thing that I start to look at now and think that uh, the, the ability to look at something as if it's beyond anything, what we would call mundane or yeah. normal, and to see that there's this sort of, you know, and I'll use that word again, magical. Yeah, well, it was, it was, you know, for two young children, it was, it was magical and also so innocent, Vic. I mean, when you think of the troubles that we have today, especially with racism <laughs> um, and the situation that's going on, and not just this country, but loads of other countries. Yes. When you're, when you're a white person living in a black country, which we were in Ghana all those years ago, there wasn't any problem then. No. There just wasn't. Now, somebody today would say, yes, but, you know, you were the colonials, you came out, they were your servants, which is quite true. I mean, all the Africans got work um, by working for the, the yes, English, yeah. English settlers. Yeah. But it was, you know, they desperately wanted work. They desperately wanted money and also, most of the families, like, for instance, all the people that work for us, my brother and I, there was no such thing as racism. They right. were just other people who we ran about with. We ran about with their children. And each family was given a compound within our land. So they, so our, our, our steward 
his name was Kofi, he would have his wife and his and his mother and his children there. And my brother and I would spend hours in his compound and he'd be sitting there eating his food and we'd be picking at his food as well. You know, there was no such, it was such an innocent time then. And also the weather was amazing. Um, you know, you, you didn't worry. You know, I used to say, mummy, you know, we're going down the road. Nobody thought, oh my God, my children are going to be abducted. No. Anything like that. Mummy and daddy used to drop us off at the beach at 10 o'clock in the morning and then pick us up at six o'clock. Yeah. You know, it was just such an easy, wonderful, free life. Yeah. Um, and that's, and people always say to me, um, and I don't know about Stuart, you know, would you ever go back? Never, because the whole illusion would be shattered. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> yes, so. Um, uh, do you think, because I want to sort of, I want to sort of get onto this thing about Stuart's perception hmm. because he had a, an ability to think magically which yes, was yeah, well we I think this is coming back into into the frame of people's thinking much more now you know whether that's psychological or whatever I don't you know that people can actually read other people well yeah. and he could certainly do that oh he certainly was I mean he certainly had a thing with other people I mean he totally understood other people in fact, he was brilliant with other people and probably lousy with his family. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Uh, but I mean, family definitely, definitely, definitely came last. Yeah, uh, but uh, don't you, uh, yeah. Uh, there's some, I was talking to somebody on another podcast, interestingly enough. It was this guy does 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 a podcast about well, it's it mostly sort of Gnosticism, you know, this sort of idea, you know, sort of spiritual stuff. Stuff, yeah. And he, he, he sort of turned around and he said, well, you know, it's all right for the, the, the type of desert fathers type of thing just to clear off and not have anything to do with anybody, mostly their family, he yeah. said, yeah. you know, uh, but he said the real work is actually dealing with your family. I, I thought that was very interesting. But that was it. He really more or less shut the family out completely. And you think that's because they felt abandoned? This is what you were saying. Yeah. 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 And uh, also, it was very hard for me because I was always there for mummy and daddy, especially when mummy died and when daddy was very ill. Yeah. And of course, Stuart never was there for them. No. Um, but they were, he was the one they wanted to see. You know, the excitement of when Stuart came over to see them all or wrote to them or run, rang them. It was a big excitement, you know. I definitely was second 11 when Stuart was around, always. What do you think that is? Is because it just because he didn't contact them very often? and that yeah. doesn't... Because he didn't give them the love that I gave them. No, exactly. And I gave my parents completely unconditional love. I was totally there for yeah. them. Yeah. So, you know, I was, I was... Yes, I mean, they were so used to having me around. And of course, they were starved and Stuart's love and Stuart's, uh, you, you, you know, or what you call it, not um, ability to be to be around. Maybe he wasn't around. He was always away. So uh, when when did the um, because you've already said that he had that entrepreneurial streak, but in a yeah. in a really different left field sort yeah, of. Yeah. Well, the first thing, I mean, the first million he made was before he was twenty six. <clears throat> He had a friend called Martin Cripps. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a frog in my throat. And they started a company called Kosha Nostra. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know why it was a, a Nost <clears throat> Nostra because he, you know Stuart's half Italian and he's got yeah. a bit of Sicilian in him. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know about the, the kosher because Martin was not a Jew, but they right. started this company called Kosher Nostra. And they used they started doing tie and dye t-shirts. This was up in Putney. Right. And they used to take all the tie and dye t-shirts to the local laundrette and then throw in the uh, the dye into the t-shirts. And uh, my mother bought them a little white van and they were forever running away because people used to come in afterwards and put yes. their sheets in. Yes. The sheets would be covered in dye. Yes. So my, my brother and Martin were forever sort of getting in the car and going, boom, rushing off to get away to find another laundrette. So he did tie and dye t shirts and got, had a shop in Carnaby Street. 
Yes, and so he sold tie-dye t-shirts and, you know, those deep jeans back in the 60s, you know, the faded jeans and the jeans with all those swirly bits on them. And he made a fortune. Amazing. I mean, absolute fortune. And by the, tw by the time he was 26, he was riding around in a big blue Rolls Royce with, he had a driver <clears throat> called, um, I think his name was Bill Witch, and he made him wear a uniform. Uh, you know, sort of complete uniform with a hat and everything. And Stuart rode about in this great big Rolls Royce, pretending to be a pop star. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. Um, yeah, he bought himself um, a beautiful uh, flat on the Chelsea embankment. And we lived, we did live there for a while and we lived the life of Riley in Chelsea, which was fantastic. And Stuart was a very generous man. I mean, he'd he'd think nothing of going off to Venice and staying at the Daniele Hotel and taking about 11 of his cohorts with him, paying for them all. Yeah. But he wouldn't dream of taking his parents or his sister on holiday or giving them any money to go on holiday or do anything. It was all either his friends or eventually when he started his movement, his movement. And I'm not sure why he was like that, but obviously it probably went back to the time when he felt yeah. resentment. But why he was as resentful of me, I don't know. But That's, that's he, unusual, <clears throat> isn't it? Um, yes, um, but, they, but there you go, there you go. That was, that was Stuart. Yeah. Um, yeah, so anyway, he did his tie-dyed cheap T-shirts and he did jeans and everything that was sort of psychedelic in Carnaby Street for a while. And then he eventually gave that up. And um, he met somebody called Marshall Lever, who was ah. a medium with a silver mind control. Yes. And he got into cahoots with him and then trained to be a medium for quite a few years. <clears throat> and he, funny enough, he used to make mummy and I go to all the meetings. Right. Circle. Well, the College of Psychic Studies. Or yeah, something. that's right, yes. So we go off to these meetings and then there'd be a moment after with the lectures and the chats and everything where Marshall Lever will say, well, right now, everybody lie on the floor and sort of let your mind float away and, um, you know, towards the end, of the, the end of the class or lesson or whatever you call it. And then suddenly you'd hear... <laughs> Would be my mother she'd fallen fast asleep snoring her head off and then you'd get one person going <laughs> and then within about five minutes the whole class was on an uproar you know because my mother was snoring away on the floor there right well i can tell you stuart managed to pick up that technique later <laughs> he went off to america after that and i don't know what happened but he did an awful lot of stuff for marshall lieber made him a lot of money, and then the whole relationship went very sour. Right. Not right. sure what happened, but I think what the gist of it was that Marshall Leader was taking Stuart for a ride. Right. The Stuart was very into him and his philosophy and his mediumism and everything. <laughs> so he stopped doing, stopped, uh, he cut all ties with Marshall Lever. So Stuart, Stuart must have been, sorry, sorry, Didi. No, no, carry no, on. No. Stuart must have been really good at this point. To oh, he was, yes. But you know, so quite, I'm, I'm skipping a few years. Yeah, because what I'm interested in is the fact that when were you aware that he was psychic like that? Was it just that when you turned up to this thing, he was involved in it? I mean, or was there anything before that you used to? Yeah, yes. You think that was peculiar? Yeah, How did you back in that? Yeah, yes, back at back in nineteen. Oh, now when was it? 1973. It was Christmas and um, I was whisked off to hospital with suspect, a suspected meningitis. Right. Literally just before Christmas at Queen Mary's Hospital in London, up in um, Sheen around there. And I was lying in my hospital bed there, having had a lumbar puncture, feeling incredibly ill. And my brother walked in and he just knew, he said, that, you know, I was still, he used to call me Fuzzy sometimes, or leader. then, I wasn't Didi much later. And he, he, um, 
he said, I knew when I knew there was something wrong and I knew I was ill. So I rang mum and dad immediately and here I am. So um, obviously that was the first time I ever experienced anything mm. like, like that with my brother. But I don't know whether that was telepathic or whether it was to do with the fact that we're twins and twins are quite a tune. Yeah, yeah. I've got twins and yeah, there is that. Right, exactly. Well, you know. So so other than that, really, I didn't really experience an awful lot. Mm. My brother's psychic psychic powers, to be absolutely honest with you, because I I didn't see him that often. Right. I mean, we did go to Sipapu once in 1992 when my children were about 13 and seven. Uh, we went to America and did a complete tour with Stuart and then up in Sipapu, up in the mountains in, in New Mexico, where he was doing seminars and things like that. Um, but otherwise, I really, really didn't experience many of his psychic. So this is interesting. So this this thing is sort of developing. And, yeah. and you're not, you're not aware part. that something's happening, but you don't know what it is. No, 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 no. Because yes. by then he was in America. Yeah. Um, when we were all in London, it wasn't something we got into. You know, we were living in Chelsea, living the high life in Chelsea, yes. having a great time. Yes. Of course, my brother got into drugs and got really badly into drugs, yeah. almost died. He went blind, actually. And I think that's the moment where he decided to come off drugs, come off drinking and be celibate. And I think he did that for about five years while he was training to be a medium. Right. Training to, to do, to do well, to join Marshall Lee as, as, a, as a medium. Um, and then he went, said, I'm going off to America. And he went off to America with Marshall Lee and of course, that's why I said, I don't know what happened, but it all went sour. Yeah. And he made a lot of money for Marshall Lever. <clears throat> um, even that, I don't remember how, but he did. And then we cut his ties and then he decided to go. I mean, this is the great thing about my brother. He was so versatile. He didn't, he had the Midas touch, whatever he touched, yes. he made money. Yes, I could imagine. He yeah. then decided for some ridiculous reason to go into real estate. So he got himself a partner I think this was in, in um, California somewhere. And it was really funny because his partner was called Savage. They said they were called Savage and Wild. Yeah, fantastic. Well, that's... And that was their real estate business. Would... Yeah. <laughs> and they made a fortune. Potion, Nostra and Savage and Wild. That's but they yeah. made a fortune out of it. <clears throat> and it was after that when he, I think he, it was after that when he started doing his, his own thing and he got married to stay in America, he got married to a lovely girl called Cynthia um, and came back to England to introduce her to my father and myself, because obviously by then my mother had passed on. Oh. And um, that marriage didn't last. I mean, when I met her, she was a lovely girl, but Stuart always had a very beautiful, glamorous, elegant woman on his hat, on his arm, usually taller than him. Yeah. And uh, Cynthia was what I would call a very sweet, homely girl. Yeah. But, you know, I think they were married for a few years and then that all dissolved and that was that. And by then Stuart had started his movement or was going towards doing his movement. And of course, the one thing that runs in our family is um, writing. My mother wrote all the time. Right. Um, I do too. I, I love writing. It's one of my passions. And of course, um, Stuart made a living out of it. Yes. And he had, uh, what was his company called? White Dove, I think it was, yeah. his publisher. He started a publishing, instead of publishing through somebody else, he was very astute. He started his own publishing company and published all his books through his company. Yeah. So, of course, all the money came back to him. He yeah. no, no sort of money to dole out to agents of things. It was all his money. And he became so popular and his books sold in thousands. Yes. And then he wrote this book called The Trick to Money is Having Some. Yeah. And it was on the, I think it was on the, it was number one bestseller in America. And I think it was on the bestseller list for about a year. Yeah. And then he also wrote his affirmations on all his other, other, other books. Yeah. Well, not that I read them all, I didn't. And, no, um, what is interesting? Did you read any of them? Uh, yeah. The reason I say that is because it, it it would have been um, too near it, the mark, Vic. 
Sorry? Too near the mark. Yeah, well, I'm just wondering about that because that's what I was thinking. It's almost like you're seeing a part of his mind that you might yeah. look at and you go like... Yeah, well, oh. exactly. That's a problem. I think I've read one of his books. I read about five pages and I thought, I can't carry on with this because there were so many dis discrepancies. And I think Stuart wrote for what he wanted people to see when he wrote to mm. get the message. Sometimes I, I don't think it was always incredibly truthful as as a history if you know what I mean. oh yeah 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 no I, yeah 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 like yeah. my mother he would embellish a story my mother was an incredible raconteur yeah. and she never let a story be told by by um telling the, the truth she always yeah. embellished all her stories yes but, you know i never read any of his books ever right. i've still got them all <laughs> Well, the interesting thing is about raconteurs, it, it's like, you know, a good story needs a bit of embellishment type of idea. And it, it is, Listen, it, don't get me wrong, I'm not criticising my brother because no. he was an incredible author. Yes, he was. He made right. a lot of money out of his books. Um, funny enough, there was a shop in Chelsea called Wild One, W-I-L-D-E, and it wasn't my brother's shop and you could walk in there and um, find all his books. And also he had a shop up in Camden Town, which for the moment, I can't actually remember the name of it. Is it called Destinies or something? No, something else, but I can't no, I know, no, Stu um, Susan. He had, had a bookshop um, up there. And she's, so she yes, I mean, he had thousands of followers yes. all over the world. Funny enough, I would say the least success he had was here in Britain. He had incredible success in Australia. Funny enough, where he met his wife, his second wife, who was a dancer like me. And um, of course, Baz was the fruit of um, that marriage, Sebastian, his son. And in America, he was very, 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 very successful. And I think in places, you know, in the northern countries like Sweden and Denmark and those sort of places, he was actually as well. And I think Italy, um, his books got translated into 28 different countries. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he did very well in that in that in that situation. And of course, from the books, he did his seminars. And with the seminars, um, again, he made a lot of money because he charged a fortune for his seminars. And, you, you know, 73,000 a week sometimes used to flow into his into his into his pocket. Stuart was not one for bank accounts and paying tax. So everything was done in cash. So he'd have wads and wads of cash. And that would be that would pay for everything. In fact, years and years later, the old tax man rang me up, rang me up, because they suddenly found me and said, We're looking for Stuart Wilder. I said, You'll be lucky, so am I. <laughs> because they because he hadn't ever paid me tax here in England. No. He had a... <clears throat> one of the things about Stuart, and it did it... You know, because uh, what you're sort of saying is it sort of fits with the sort of flavour of this. That he sort of had this ability. Hang on a minute. Yeah. Boys, hello. Uh, sorry, but could you keep quiet? I'm trying to do this interview. Bugger off. <laughs> They're making tea. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Is is the he, he had this sort of way of sort of living between places if you see what i mean it's almost like he could slide under the radar and and yeah, yes. and um a lot and he, of like blitz <laughs> like well this. yeah but even psychologically it was like that he was he had this sort of thing where he and i think this is where he sort of slipped out of view a little bit at the moment yeah. this is why i wanted to really get, let anybody get too close to him he oh only, no he no. only ever had one one residence which was um ptolemac ptolemac castle or ptolemac which is camelot backwards by the yes. way and he had this enormous estate in in um not sydney in in milton yes in 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 new new south wales in australia it was supposed to be the most incredible house i've never been there funny enough i Next year, his son's getting married, and I would love to go over there just to go to the house to get the vibe. And um, it was one of those houses which he had built himself into a mountain. And I know he he shipped totem poles from New Mexico all the way to Australia to have at the house. 
and he also found an eight foot Japanese stone, which they, he had dumped in the house and then he built a bathroom around it. <laughs> Things like that. That's incredible. Apparently you'd walk into the front door and then look up to the ceiling and there was a bottomless, not bottomless, sort of glass, a glass um, swimming pool. So you could see people swimming, you know, and, and things, things like that. He was a very eccentric yes. um, English millionaire. And I think the tourist, local tourist companies used to come as near as they can to the house and say, this is where this eccentric millionaire called Stuart Wilde lives, who's a new age guru and an author, very, very well renowned new age author. Well, this is the thing, you see, because I think if you go back to that that period when he was really, he was sort of, and his, his books were selling at their height, he was an incredible inspiration to a lot of people who then wow. later on went on to do something, you know, similar. Um, you know, who, a lot of miserable people in, in the world who needed somebody to, to attach themselves to somebody and, and their philosophy and their doctrine. And... Um, they did in their hordes and I you know I mean I would think that that is the positive thing to say about Stuart oh yes he helped, yeah he helped thousands of people he did he did yes they had to pay for it and he ended up with a beautiful girlfriend called Cecilia Chancellor um who comes her, her sister was the um not was the girl the girl in um what was that film not Notting Hill the other one Four Weddings and the uh, Duck Face Oh, right. sister, yeah, and he went out with her. They, she comes from the Debenham family, and he went out with her, her with about seven or eight years. And her, her husband, no, her father was the editor of the Spectator, Alexander Chancellor. I don't think he was very happy about Stuart going out with his with his daughter, to be honest. But anyway, that's that's that that's sort of another story. But yes, he helped an awful lot of people. Mm -hmm. And his his little wife, um, Robin, who I get on very well even now, I think followed him around the world when he went to Australia, and then she went to America, and then they got married and and had 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 Sebastian. But he did have a magic about him, Vic. He did, yeah. And people adored him, and they revered him like a god. Yeah. And Stuart lapped it up. He loved it but then i have to say in his defense we were very similar i love attention all my life i've been on the stage i love people watching me dance and this and that the other i i love all that so and he was he had that in abundance and he was very charismatic and also when he made his speeches he was very funny very dry oh. and very cruel sometimes. Yes. But a very, very dry sense of humor. And he'd have people in absolute stitches. Right. Let, let's just focus on this a minute because I, he was. And, we're talking, you said about the sort of the raconteur, like your, your mother was really, really good. Yeah. I mean, Stuart was just incredibly funny. And, and right. he, could, he could tell a story that would be. Well, we've just, you couldn't breathe for laughing, I right? Well, um, and, and uh, you know, he could have easily been a stand-up comedian. There's no, there's no, 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 no two ways. That's more or less what he did when he did his seminars. He was a stand-up comedian. He was we, very, very funny. He was writing, a, he was writing something f for somebody, as a, a, like a film script. Oh, he did lots of things like yeah. that. Well, yeah, because we haven't got, gone into the, the music and all the rest of it yet. But... Music and film scripts and various things. Yeah. You've got to understand, Vic, I, I, you know, I was his sister, I was his twin. But between a certain time of his life and his death, I probably saw him, if, if it was 10 times, I'd think I'm lucky. Mm. So there's periods, enormous periods of his life, yeah. which I never saw him. I mean, just for instance, this is very strange. The week before he died, I hadn't seen him for two or three years, bearing in mind. He rang me and he said, hello, darling. Um, you know, I'd like to come and see you. Hmm. I said, OK, Stuart, when were you thinking? He said, well, you know, soon. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, now. I said, where are you? He said, I'm at the bottom of your drive. <laughs> So he came in with his girlfriend, Jules, 
And we had, it was in the afternoon, I gave him a bit of lunch and we had a lovely chat and it was very loving and very warm. And he wasn't well. Whether he knew he was going to die, I don't know, but he came to see me to say goodbye. And a yeah. week later, he died in, in the mountain up in Lara. Yeah. So um, that was Stuart, you know, <laughs> we, yeah. I never saw him from year to year. And then suddenly he'd turn up. Yes. Yes. And he'd, um, or other times he'd ring up. This is where I found it so strange about my brother, because I did, I didn't like him very much sometimes, but I did love him. Yeah. unconditionally but he'd ring up and he'd say hello Dee Dee I'm here I said oh great Danny where are you and what he used to do he used to take he used to take over a whole a whole part of the Royal Crescent Hotel yes. in Bar. yes not just for himself but his followers yes I said oh great darling you know how lovely have you just arrived oh no I've been here three months and then he contacted me after three months. Yeah. And you don't live far away, do you? I live 25 minutes yeah, away. No. <laughs> this, is, this is the thing about Stuart. It was always lovely to see him, but you always felt like it was sort of not an obligation, but he was doing you a favour by coming to see you or being nice to you or whatever, you know. Um, so there was some great swathes of his life that I actually know nothing about. And his followers would be able to tell you, you know, little Amanda, who he went out with for a while, was part of the movement and who adored Stuart. I think probably the nice one of the nicest girls he was with. Though Jules, the poor girl who he was with when he was when he died, and the movement was so horrible to her. She was very sweet. I did like her. Um, you, you know, they know they probably know Stuart much better than I do. I knew him in the young, in his young age, but his yeah. later life, they know him so much better than I but do. The thing is, Dee Dee, what I'm interested in with this is those are early years that you've said is they are pivotal moments yeah. that tell a lot about somebody. And what goes on later is built upon those early ways of looking at the world. Yeah. And I see it all the time when yeah. I interview people. And I suppose because, I don't know, I've, I've probably got a bit of a knack of being able to spot it. I don't, I don't quite know, but <clears throat> those things really interest me. And what comes out after that, you know, there'll, there'll be a lot of people who will know their side of the story about this situation or whatever. And I don't think that there's probably anybody that you can sort of go, this person's got the full story with Stuart. Apart from Stuart, but we can't we can't speak to him at the moment. So it's you know it's one of those sort of things. And but as I say, those are that the early parts of this is so important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it, it is because um, our childhood obviously was was difficult, and it was also wonderful. But there was two sort of different spheres of our childhood: one bad, one one good which obviously did affect Stuart badly. Yes. It kind of affected me. I just sailed through life, really, just being me. Um, but with Stuart, it, he did find his young younger life very complex and, and difficult and mm. obviously wasn't a happy bunny. No, no. But again, you know, that might have driven his work. Oh, I think it did. Mm. Oh, definitely. But I mean, you know, he definitely got his, his dry business sense, his humour and everything from my mother. I am much more, my father was a sort of quintessentially English gentleman with a, uh, I'm going to say monologue, but it's not a yeah, monologue. No, monocle. monocle. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't, yeah, I don't my mouth. Yeah. yeah and, and I'm a lot more, you know, like my father, polite and all the rest of it. Stuart didn't, you know, he didn't really give a shit. You know, if he, yeah. if he wanted to say something or do something, he'd do it. He wouldn't worry about what people felt, thought, no. whatever, if anything else. No. I was much more mindful, much more like my father. No. But luckily, some of mum did rub, up, did rub off on me. So, of course, um, I suppose if you, if you looked at Stuart and I, um, especially in our younger days, when I went into Pan's People and became famous, mm. I was the one in the limelight. Yeah. And then it, later, it was, it was him. And the Stuart never, ever, ever ever would say anything to me like you know well done Dee, Dee this that and the other 
or or, or um, acknowledge the fact that I'd done very well as a dancer. Never, never. I don't know if it was a jealousy or what. I don't know. But he never did. It didn't bother me. I didn't think about it. But when Stuart died and I went to my children, and I went to Lara for his wake and everything. Almost every person to the man said, Stuart was so proud of you, Dee. Yes, he I was going to say that. All, all the time. So proud of what you did, what yeah. you achieved in your life with your dancing and your, your studio and, you know, other things that I've done in my life. Mm. So he, well, that's interesting because I, I was going to say that because it, I, I've, I've heard him speak, you know. And of course, I was very proud of him. And I, even, yes. now, even now, I sort of always mention my brother and New Age or yes. how yes. successful he was and yeah. all those sort of things. Yeah. Do you think that's just something, because my father was like that. Hmm. He, would never, he would never compliment me to my face, but he would always talk to somebody else about what I was yeah, doing. I guess, I think, but also with Stuart, you know, with his whole movement, Vic, you know, he had so many followers mm. and people who used to literally, you know, sit there waiting for every word he spoke. Yes. For yeah. some people, it actually saved their lives. In some ways, he had to be like that. You know, he was the important one. Everybody came to him. He couldn't have somebody else having the limelight. It had to be maybe, Stuart. No, maybe that's true. It had to be Stuart. And in some ways, that was his strength because he was God or the guru or whatever they wanted to call him, their mentor. Um, um, it was very important for him to have that persona. Yeah. Besides the fact, I think he liked it. But there was a very strange side to Stuart. I think he loved the adulation. He loved having, Stuart always had to have people around him. Didn't really like to be on his own. So wherever you were, there was always hundreds and hundreds of people around him. And you would think, because of that and because his wonderful way of speaking and writing that we'd be a very flamboyant person. But I remember once one of his school friends gave a big party for his birthday. And funny enough, Stuart was in England and I went. And Stuart went and sat down at a table and wouldn't move and wouldn't talk to anybody. He suddenly went into himself and got became incredibly shy. I wouldn't talk to anybody. Okay. I said, Stuart, come on, darling. You know, Johnny, you know Johnny really well. You were, you know, school together. And he just sat there waiting for people to come up to him and talk. And even if he did, they did, he would be monosyllabic. He had those moments where yeah. some demon or something got into him. And he'd mm. suddenly become this incredible introverted person. Mm. Very weird. Yeah. Not, yeah. The, not, not, not the brother that I know. <laughs> yeah, it's strange, isn't it? Very odd. Anyway, well, that, that was brilliant. That was absolutely brilliant. Well, the thing is, Vic, there's so much more I could tell you about Stuart, you know. I mean, I could go on and I could go on and I could go on. And at the end of the day, when I look back, my biggest regret when he died is, and also for my husband, Henry, actually, because I don't think he liked my first husband very much. He never said so, but I sort of got that feeling. But Henry said to me, it was so awful that Stuart died because he would love to have got to know him better. Mm. And Stuart had just got to that point in his life where he was ready to not settle down, but buy another property, yeah. which was either going to be in England or France. Mm. And I was very pleased about that because I thought if he does that and he works from his property, I can go and visit him and we could have the brother and sister relationship that we've never really had in our life. Yeah. And then, of course, a week later, he died. Yeah. And that was, I must admit, for me, that was an incredible shock. Strangely enough, my husband was in Geneva, and it was the one night that we weren't together. We've been together 20 years now. And he was away. And Jane, one of the girls in the movement, she said, Dee, I've got something to tell you. And she just came out with it. She said, Stuart's dead. And it was the biggest shock it, yeah. really, it took me a long time to get over that a long time yeah i think because not just that we were twins but it was the regret vic the regret yeah. that i didn't spend enough time with my beloved brother yeah. you, you know for him to get to know me really well in my latter years and my children and everything um 
and that was that was very sad. Also, I, I want I want to say that in a lot of ways, sometimes Stuart was very generous. Oh yes. Um, he yeah. came. I he used to come and visit us in Waldemar Avenue, where we lived, and he said, "Right, children, you take take um, Alexander and Poppy, my children. We're going up to Hamley's, all right." And then we get to the door of Hamley's, and he looked at his watch and he said, "Right, you've got an hour." Get some trolleys and take go and get as many toys as you can in an hour. God, <laughs> God. that's amazing. Yeah. He did those sort of things. Yeah. And then uh, I remember, oh yes, on our 48th birthday, funny enough, I was starring, would you believe, in Daz Rheingold at the Royal Opera House. I was, I was dancing the role of Erda. And Stuart just happened to be around. And he gave, he used to stay a lot in Blake's Hotel. In yes, the, yeah, yeah, well, they did, yeah. And we had a dinner party. Um, uh, we had a dinner party at Blake's on our 40, 48th birthday. And Stuart gave me a little box. And when I opened it up, it, it was £2,000 in notes, which was very nice. And then when Henry and I got married, he gave us $8,000. In, again, in a little box. Those are the sort of things Stuart, Stuart yeah. would do every now and then. But those are the only times he ever, ever, you know, our birthdays would come and go. I remember our 50th birthday, I bought him something beautiful from from um, Venice and he never gave me anything, nothing at yeah. all. Yeah. Stuart, that, it was just Stuart's way. It was yeah, his no, way. It's... Yeah, very weird, bizarre way of doing things. Yeah. And... Um, but very, very generous to other people, but not his family. That was the weirdest thing. Um, not more, not, I remember when mummy when mommy died, he didn't even come over for her funeral and she would have been devastated if she'd known because she adored Stuart, absolutely adored him. Mm. And the same with my father. He, was, he said he was too busy. I think there was that resentment there. That's all I can think because I can't believe that people are so cruel I think Stuart was just res resentful of the fact that he was abandoned as, as a child, you know. Yeah, well, it was it's quite a shocking story yeah. that you told us at the beginning. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that was wonderful, Dee Dee. Thank you. Oh, it's all right, Vic. Thank you very much. Yes, sorry about the beginning. It's, you know, all this is so technical. And, and it Oh, come on, don't worry about it. It happens it's even if you've been to the time, it happens. It's, <laughs> it's sort of like whatever... You know, whatever the, the Zoom gremlins decide on the day. But well, yeah, it's brilliant. Just, just to say that, that, that you know, oh, okay, so I, maybe I was, I ha, I'm a little bit critical of some of the things my brother did. But I think basically, um, all in all, uh, my brother, you know, his saving grace was that he helped so many people. Yes, yes, I think that's, and, and that came back. Um, we have to, we have to salute him and say, you know, he was, a, he was a wonderful, wonderful person. Well, that's that's why I'm, 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 I'm doing this. Is, the, the pathos is it of it was, he saved so many people, but he couldn't save himself. Uh, yeah, but that might be the way of things, mightn't it? Yeah. In a way. Anyway, sweetheart, lovely to meet you. Yes. And you that, lovely, lovely to chat again. Do keep in touch. Will do. Good. Keep All writing right. those books. What? Keep writing those books. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I've written two. I've written, I've written my book of malapropisms. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I've got some of them. And I've, been... and I've wrote, obviously, the Pans People one and all my children's stories, which my husband's going to start animating for me. And I've got That'd a few be lovely. up my sleeve. I mean, for me, it's mostly mostly just I'm doing it because I love it, not because I'm going to make fortunes like Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Nick. Yeah, all the best. Thank you very much. So links in the show notes to Stuart's uh, books and also we didn't mention the fact that he produced some really amazing music as well. So um, I'll put uh, a link to to those uh, and they are ma amazing uh, collaborations with people. So yes, I will see you soon. Until then. Mm -hmm.